Uh, we're quite delighted to have Jonathan uh, Alter with us this evening, um, because if you want to understand Obama and his presidency, you'd be hard pressed to find someone more authoritative and more articulate than Jonathan. Many of you no doubt recognize him for nearly three decades. Uh, he was synonymous with Newsweek, where he was a senior editor, media critic, and columnist. Uh, he's also become a familiar face on NBC News and MSNBC, offering analysis. And since 2001, he's been a columnist for Bloomberg View. Uh, if that weren't enough, he's established himself as well as a successful author, uh, the Center Holes, Obama and His Enemies, his latest book, uh, is the third one he's written in the last seven years. Uh, in it, he chronicles the 2012 campaign, which of the nine campaigns that Jonathan, Jonathan has covered uh, is considered by him the most consequential, and he'll explain why in a minute. Uh, the book contains lots of I interesting nuggets, but the most revealing and fascinating pages for me were those on the a highly sophisticated data campaign uh, run by Obama's team in Chicago. Uh, this operation, what Jonathan calls a new kind of political machine, with its innovative use of digital technology and social media, its integration of analytics and field uh, activities, was instrumental in securing Obama's reelection and has set a, a new standard for future campaigns. Um, there's, there's certainly no secret uh, who Jonathan was rooting for to win, uh, and how relieved he was at the result. But uh, reviewers of his book have commended him for chronicling not just Obama's success, but the missteps and, and screw-ups as well. A Washington Post review said, the center holds, quote, will be required reading for any serious student of the Obama presidency, present or future. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Jonathan Alter. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, thank you, and thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to see this legendary bookstore thriving, and it's just, uh, when, when I've been traveling around the country, and the book business in general, as I think all of you know, is has been going through a transition. Um, one of the great pieces of news is that there are actually more independent bookstores now than there used to be. I think there were 68 that were just opened in the last year, and it's just such a wonderful development. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay. It's just a wonderful development, and it's great to see all of you out here supporting politics and prose as I do. Um, so I want, to, um, I want to talk about why I thought this was such an important election, and I want to talk about how Obama won, also how Romney lost it. Um, but I actually wanted to start out uh, with a story that is um, indirectly connected to Obama's victory and goes to the level of human motivation and how one person can shape history. Um, the story actually starts on a dark, pitch black night in the Florida Everglades in 2005, and a woman is driving her car, uh, and she goes off the road and plunges into a canal. Um, and passerbys, uh, you know, aren't quite sure what to do. Somebody uh, breaks his arm trying to open the door of the submerged car. They start screaming for help, and uh, nearby, a then 33-year-old. Um, uh, salesman at a motorcycle company um, hears the screams and he sprints toward the scene uh, when he gets there he's told she's gone dude she's gone there's no use uh, he ignores that he jumps into the canal and after a lot of effort he's able to get the door open but sees that she's strapped in into her seat with a seat belt he gets out they finally get a knife from a car he jumps in again. He cuts the seatbelt. Uh, the woman floats to the surface where she's revived. Uh, then in the pitch black, uh, they, uh, he hears uh, yells of baby seat, baby seat that had floated to the surface. And he jumps in a third time. 
and uh, he can't see in front of his face at all. He's feeling around on the back of the car to see if he can find a baby. Unfortunately, there was no baby uh, in the car. Um, the man uh, was decorated as a hero by the town of Davie, Florida, and um, an insurance company also gave, it a, gave him a commendation uh, for heroism. Um, seven years later, um, this man, whose name is Scott Prudy, was working as a bartender uh, for a catering company in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. And um, I spent a lot of time with Scott uh, earlier this year. Um, I actually met him when he came up for the inauguration. At that time, he was still in, in uh, you know, hadn't surfaced at all publicly. He just did once on MSNBC, as some of you might have seen. Wasn't interested in publicity. Uh, but I was very interested in his motivation and, and why he... Um, he did what he did, and um, finally, um, he said one night, apropos of, of this incident, uh, he said, you know, what I learned from that was if you can jump in, you must jump in, and he felt that he had an obligation uh, when, um, when he made this videotape of Mitt Romney that he had an obligation to do something with it. He spent the first two weeks after the fundraiser not um, he didn't even look at it. And then he woke up in the middle of the night and he went into the bathroom and he looked in the mirror and he said, you are a fucking coward. And the next day he began to post little bits of the video. Um, what had, had alarmed him most was not the 47% comments, but Romney's comments about a Chinese uh, sweatshop that he felt uh, Romney was making approving comments about this sweatshop, and so uh, Scott adopted the identity of a uh, young Chinese factory worker, um, and he put her picture from the cover of a book called Factory Girl uh, by Leslie Chang, which we probably have in the bookstore here, and he put that on his uh, uh, on his Twitter account and, and, and his email, and he called himself Anne, A-N-N-E, Anonymous 670, and began to post um, the quite offensive uh, comments that Romney was making about um, this Chinese um, factory. Uh, and then eventually um, he, uh, uh, because David Korn of Mother Jones had written about um, these Chinese labor abuses, he, he gave the full tape to, uh, to David, but by that time he'd already been posting for several weeks and he was very much in control of the release of this tape. Um, and, uh, but I got, um, I got interested in the class dimensions of this campaign and, and Scott Prudy was, uh, self-described blue collar worker, uh, didn't finish college. Um, but was able to um, level the playing field when he had the opportunity to jump in. Uh, and he said that at one point he felt uh, when Romney was talking about this Chinese factory, he, he said, uh, you know, I felt like yelling at him, hey, Mitt, would you want your wife working there? Are we all going to be working at these places in Ohio, you know, if you're president? Um, but he didn't want the tape cut off and he was worried about the secret service agent was right by the bar and he put a bar cloth over it. You can see on the 68 minute tape for a minute, there's a cloth over it. Um, and, uh, he moved through as a, an actor in history. Now, why was it so significant? Well, this now goes to a kind of a horse race question. Uh, after the tape was released in September of last year, Obama opened up a seven-point lead in the polls, and a lot of people, including a lot of people at his headquarters in Chicago, thought it was all over. Uh, but then he had that debate in Denver that you all remember on December 3rd, and I would argue that if he hadn't had the cushion, that seven-point cushion that was provided by uh, the 47% incident, that he would have slipped uh, – uh, behind Romney after that first debate, and it might have been very difficult for him to catch up. Uh, no way to ever prove it, but uh, 
it makes sense to me. I think he would have been in a, a much more precarious position um, had uh, had it not been for that incident that gave him that cushion. Um, but uh, it interested me um, in many other ways as well. I just have one chapter out of 26 about it, but uh, um, turns out that 40 years ago in 1972, Richard Nixon ran an ad on television sponsored actually by something called Democrats for Nixon. Uh, he carried 49 states that year uh, while he was his people were bugging the Watergate, a story you all know. Um, and in the ad, a uh, construction worker goes out onto a, a beam and he's eating his lunch. In those days, he was called a hard hat. And the announcer says, Senator George McGovern proposed in the U.S. Senate that a welfare bill be passed that would make 47% of Americans eligible for welfare. That's right, 47%. Uh, and uh, it struck me that you know these class themes, they go back a ways in our politics. Uh, money in politics, these themes go back a ways. So I wanted to introduce historical context. You know, the 1896 election had a lot in common with the 2012 election. And Mark Hanna, who was William McKinley's campaign manager, said, uh, and Carl Rove's role model, as, as Rove will tell anybody, uh, said, uh, there are two things that are important in politics, money, and I can't remember what the other one was. <laughs> Um, and so all, all these years later, um, you know, these, these class themes, these themes of how much money you can raise and from whom, uh, loom very large in our politics. Uh, I thought that, uh, the American social contract was on the line in this election, which was why I considered it to be the most significant election of my lifetime. I covered nine presidential elections for Newsweek magazine. Um, every four years, some candidate, I'm sure many of you saw this, they'd say, this is the most important election of my lifetime. And what, and it, what it was, was it was important to them because they were running, right? <laughs> but it wasn't, really that, it wasn't really that important whether Bill Clinton or Bob Dole won in 1996. I mean, Bob Dole's health care plan is basically Obamacare. You know, they were, they both believed in the uh, 20th century consensus on uh, a, a, a social contract, what we owe each other. Dole would have never thought of suggesting that Medicare be privatized, for instance, something like that. So, but this time it was really on the line. The whole uh, definition of what we owe each other, the definition of what the role of government is. Uh, was teed up, and I think the uh, the best way to understand that is to look at the career of somebody like Paul Ryan. So um, many of Congressman Ryan's uh, favorite books, uh, I'm sure, are carried in this bookstore, as they are in almost any uh, bookstore, because the novels of Anne Rand remain very popular, particularly with adolescent boys. <laughs> and then at a certain point, uh, you know, the boys grow up a little, they realize these are turgid, boring novels, and they're not as mad at their parents, so they're not as mad at the government, and they they grow out of their Anne Rand stage. Um, Paul Ryan never did. <laughs> and and that's not that's not an insult, it's just a straight depiction of, of of the of the facts. I really try to live in this book under the sovereignty of facts. And so in two thousand five, for instance, uh, at the uh, 100th anniversary of Ayn Rand's birth, he gave the keynote speech to the Atlas Society, uh, and he explained in this speech, uh, he recited big chunks of her novels from, her, from, from memory, and he explained how he gave as gifts to everybody who worked in his office uh, copies of Atlas Shrugged uh, or other Ayn Rand novels, and how she remained the most important political thinker uh, in his life, who had shaped his thinking and whom he relied on, as he said, every day 
for guidance about how to vote in the House of Representatives. Now, when uh, he kind of moved up in the world, he had to abandon Ayn Rand's atheism, but he never abandoned uh, her economic views. And if you look at the Ryan plan, it is an Ayn Rand plan, essentially. Uh, and it doesn't just, um, you know, cut social programs by, you know, 10 percent here, 5 percent there. We're talking 40, 50, 60 percent reductions and um, uh, elimination of, of many of, of these programs. And there's a very realistic chance that it would have been approved had were Romney president right now. So people are people are kind of, you know, they're upset with President Obama. They think he's besieged by these problems. They're mad at him over the NSA story or I'm, I'm annoyed with him over the, the AP, uh, you know, press story. Everybody's got their issue or a lot of people do. But as a thought experiment, I think it's useful to think like where would we be right now had Romney and Ryan won the election? Uh, and anybody – and look at the glass half full if you're a, a progressive Democrat uh, because um, the Ryan plan probably would have they, – they would have – on the first day, they would have uh, repealed Obamacare. That was a gimme. Uh, but then the Ryan plan, um, with everything that that included – would likely have passed uh, with 51 votes in the Senate um, in the same way that Obamacare passed with 51 votes in the Senate. If it involves budget and taxes, the, the rules, the Senate rules under the so-called Byrd rule allows you to, to get it through with 51 votes. So in all likelihood, some version of the Ryan plan would have become law. And, and actually, Ra Romney's transition team had already designated Paul Ryan to, to handle the budget uh, should he become vice president. Um, Ryan was so confident that he was going to become vice president that on the night before the election, the only thing he wanted to talk to his aides about was, uh, do I have to resign immediately at my house seat when I become vice president-elect? And next night when he lost, he was just flattened. He was stunned. He was described to me by the person who told him he lost, that he was just completely bowled over. He could not believe it. It came out of nowhere for him. Romney also was so surprised that he prepared no concession speech. So how did they construct this alternative universe for themselves? And how were they so uh, out to lunch about what was actually going on in the country? That's part of the story that I try to, to tell in the book. Um, and, uh, you know, it goes back to um, um, the establishment of what I call Fox Nation, you know, their own – self-contained world, which they believed was America, and that the uh, Obama coalition of uh, women, blacks, Latinos, young people, um, had carried one state for George McGovern in the election I was just talking about in 1972, and that they were the America, the old America, and that they had a last hurrah in them. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, and the Obama people did a lot to make sure it didn't work out that way. I think everybody knows that um, Obama ran a better digital campaign than Romney. What I wanted to do was show how, how that happened. What was the Facebook tool that they built? And it, what were, how did they take online fundraising from $15 million a month to $150 million a month in a three-month period, uh, cracking the code, average donation for Obama, $66, average donation for Romney, over $1,000. How did they do this? It's a fascinating story for me, and I, I, most of it I couldn't learn until after the election. Uh, much of it was done by these uh, analytics uh, geeks in what they called the cave, which was a secret annex off the main floor of the Obama headquarters, where they designed these models and algorithms. Um, and uh, um, the head of the cave told everybody uh, who was going to work there, look, we're not selling popsicles here. We're reelecting a president of the United States. You'll be here until after midnight every night between now and the election. Your family life is over if you have one. Uh, um, and if you don't, if you don't want that, you're not in. They, 
to get in was extremely difficult. They, uh, you had to pass a, an excruciatingly difficult online exam. Um, uh, and so they, they had not just data scientists, but they had uh, extraordinarily high IQ people uh, from all walks of life. They had a biophysicist, child prodigy, three professional poker players. Uh, and um, and they, um, they re-engineered, with a lot of help from people from other parts of the campaign, who were not in the cave, they re-engineered uh, American politics. So what, what uh, Franklin Roosevelt did for radio, as I describe in, in, in my first book, The Defining Moment, and John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan did for television, Barack Obama did for the internet. He figured out how to put together the first true 21st century campaign, and it was far beyond what they did in 2008. Um, so, uh, but the good news about it was, because it can sound a little creepy, micro-targeting, you know, with the NSA scandal, like, do, they really, do we really want them knowing all this stuff? But the good news was that this new Chicago machine, as I call it, was able to reconnect neighbor to neighbor, uh, reestablish a um, ground level politics that had gone out of fashion in this country over the last half century, when so much was dominated by television advertising and uh, you know what was on the evening news. And so, message was still extraordinarily important, and I devote a fair amount to that. Uh, media was still very, very important especially uh, what Obama did in the Latino Spanish language media to run up uh, his totals to 71% of the Latino vote. If that hadn't happened, there would be no debate now about immigration. If he'd won 60, 65% of the vote of the Latinos, he still would have won the election, uh, but we wouldn't be talking about immigration right now. Uh, it was his ability to appeal to Latinos in a new way that was brand new. But the really new thing, was to give the Obama volunteers in battleground states the information that they needed to uh, not go to every house on the block, but just go to the three or four houses where Mrs. Jones hadn't returned her application for an absentee ballot, Mr. Smith needed a ride to the polls on election day, you know, Mrs. Johnson uh, wasn't registered yet, but ch had shown some evidence of being a potential Obama supporter. And they married technology and shoe leather in a way that reconnected people uh, because the most powerful form of politics is face-to-face, friend-to-friend, or Facebook friend to Facebook friend. Uh, but somebody you know urging you to act is much more powerful than just seeing an ad on television. So the super PAC billionaires, they, they spent hu literally hundreds of millions of dollars on ads that didn't work. Whereas the Obama campaign, they they spent more than a billion dollars, uh, but on tools and ideas that helped to re use technology to reestablish an older and more appealing kind of politics. And what they wanted, what did they want to know about you? Actually, not whether you drive a Volvo and you know drink lattes. That that the consumer information was actually not important for them. They, they would use it to some extent, but the important data was, let's say you were what they called a sporadic voter, meaning you hadn't voted in 2010. 50 million fewer people voted in 2010 than in 2008. Went down from 130 million Americans in 2008 to 80 million in 2010. Obama had to get a significant share of those 50 million people back in order to win the election. So Romney and his pollsters and Gallup, they all assumed a lot of those people weren't gonna vote. They were unlikely voters. Obama, and that's why the, one of the main reasons the polls were so off. Obama said, well, no, we don't see them as unlikely voters. We see them as potential Obama voters. We just have to find them and bring them back. Uh, and so they would, maybe, maybe they'd have a notation from an old campaign that you know, Sally Smith had uh, worked uh, uh, in 1998 on an environmental campaign. We hadn't voted in 2010, but, you know, maybe worth going and trying to get Sally Smith's vote. 
even though she was, by all conventional definitions, a uh, unlikely voter. Um, so uh, it it did become almost a science. But as the field director of the Obama campaign told me, Jeremy Byrd, none of it would have worked without the passion on the ground. Now, where did that passion on the ground come from? Uh, it was partly uh, out of just people who continue to revere the president and have a regard for him that has been often missed by the media. But some of it was anger. And as Al Sharpton said to me about African-American voters, uh, blacks vote for two reasons, Sharpton told me, hope and anger. We voted out of hope in 2008 and out of anger in 2012. Why the anger? Voter suppression. So what I tried to do in the book was to put together the first full account of what I call the Voter Suppression Project, which was a coordinated effort that was initially successful in 19 states uh, to make it more difficult for Democratic constituency groups to, to vote under the ruse that they were trying to reduce voter fraud, which, as a number of court cases showed, basically didn't exist. Uh, so this was a, a, a very explicit effort, which Bill Clinton said uh, was worse than what he'd seen in, the, in Jim Crow, Arkansas, when he was a boy. Uh, and uh, I think people saw little bits of it in dribs and drabs. I wanted to paint a fuller picture of the way um, this worked. But it turned out that the Republicans got the worst of both worlds. A series of court decisions and other ways of pushing back uh, made it um, very hard. For, uh, basically, these, these voter suppression efforts did not stay on the books. They were overturned as unconstitutional or uh, otherwise. If they weren't unconstitutional, judges said it's too soon to do them in the 2012 election. So this is something Democrats have to worry about in future elections. But so the, the laws didn't end up staying on the books, although at 1 a.m. on the Friday before the election, Bob, Bob Bauer, the president's lawyer, was and the campaign lawyer was still in, having to go into court in Florida to try to uh, restore some early voting uh, hours. Um, so the, a lot of the fight on voter suppression went right up to the end. But they got the worst of both worlds because there was the most of them didn't stay on the books and there was a huge backlash. And uh, uh, so, uh, for instance, uh, Michael Nutter, the mayor of Philadelphia, called um, uh, Jim Messina, the Obama campaign manager, on, on Election Day and said, you know, they're talking about a white wave, George Will and all these People are saying that Obama's that Romney's going to get over 300 electoral votes. So there's a wave coming. It's a huge black wave because my folks are tired of them fucking with our president, and they were going to line up all night if necessary to vote for him. And that's what happened. That's what happened in Ohio and Florida and Pennsylvania. And black turnout in Ohio was higher in 2012 than it was in 2008, which is an amazing uh, statistic to me. Um, and um, so I, I know I want to leave as much time as I can for, for your questions. My book covers a lot of other things from getting bin Laden uh, to uh, election night, Fairmont Hotel, NBC News calls the election for Obama. And Valerie Jarrett says, you won. And the president says, I'll believe it when I hear it on Fox. <laughs> uh, so I wanted, to try to, I wanted to try to pull back that curtain on, on what was going on behind the scenes in a lot of different areas. But uh, I, 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 I'm more, rather than telling you about all these other uh, things that are in the book, uh, I wanted uh, the opportunity to hear your questions. So thank you so much for listening. is about the remarks about class you made at the beginning. Uh, another author was here, I don't know, several months ago and pointed out that the people who voted for Senator, that the pattern, the states that voted for Senator McCain were the same ones that voted for William Jennings Bryan in yeah. 1896. 
Yeah. I mean, the Pretty South close, is easy. The to, South was solid. The South, you yeah, understand, that's yeah. that's the white switching from yeah. Democrat to Republican. But what about the Midwest and the Plain States and uh, those kinds of places? Well, I mean, Michigan. Uh, yeah, well, Michigan ended up going for uh, Obama both times. Um, and there's a whole story there that relates to the auto industry and right. to, um, uh, and this was very important in Michigan and Ohio. And, you know, Joe Biden said, Bin Laden's dead and General Motors is alive and you don't have to know anything else. Uh, and and there, was a lot of, there was a lot of truth to that because Bin Laden, uh, that took national security away from the Republicans, which they had dominated on those grounds for a long time. Um, and there's, a, to me, a fascinating story about how Romney, the son of the head of American Motors, blew that issue, which I, which I tell in the book. But in answer to your question, um, the, uh, the Midwest, where um, the battle has been fought in recent years, has become increasingly democratic. Um, and so it used to, I'm from Illinois, and the, you know, part of my, my own story is that I, I'm, I'm from Chicago, and um, I met Obama uh, quite a while ago, and my mother knew him as, back as far as the early 1980s. Uh, Illinois used to be a battleground state. Uh, Michigan used to be a battleground state. They're not anymore. This is a big problem for the Republican Party. So the states that McCain and Romney won were very lightly populated states without very many electoral votes. And that's why uh, Obama won a very healthy victory both times in the Electoral College. Uh, so um, Bryant lost, and uh, McCain lost, and Romney lost. And it's not a majority anymore, and it's... Uh, Going to be uh, going to be tough, I think, for the Republican Party in presidential elections. They'll do well in the midterms, but it'll be tough for them in presidential elections unless they change their message to appeal to the new, changing face of America. Uh, just one um, one story about um, how significant Obama's victory was and how relieved he was by it. He said that 2012 was more important than 2008, uh, and. Uh, after the election, and the Washington Post reviewer said I should have just ended my book on this anecdote. Um, after the election, uh, an African-American friend was there for a party, a uh, small party with the president's good friends, the ones he really relaxes around. And um, Obama said, you know, I'm the only uh, Democratic president since Franklin Roosevelt, and the only president since Eisenhower, to win an outright majority, 51% twice. A, a lot of two-term presidents, there were third-party candidates, they, they got under 50%, all of them, in, in, the, in the last half century. Uh, and so uh, his friend uh, says, so let me get this perfectly clear. I guess that makes you a bad motherfucker, <laughs> says to the president of the United States. And Obama, without missing a beat, says, that's my point. <laughs> So, you know, he, he, knows, he knows that this map that you were talking about, he redrew the map. Now, we'll see whether it lasts. I don't, I don't know that it was a re realigning election. Uh, it, it's not that like the Democrats are going to go to 49 states. They're going to be these solid Republican South for a long time in the way there was a solid Democratic South for, the same reason. Uh, for a lot of the same reasons. Um, I also was one of those that we're using all of the statistics, and I can say that it was great to go into sometimes going past Confederate flags and asking for the young person in the house. I mean, uh, they had really zeroed in on everyone. Uh, uh, but my question um, is, how do you think the recent that's a great changes? Story. That's an amazing yeah. story. <laughs> the yeah. recent changes with the um, Voting Rights Act at the Supreme Court are going to impact the yeah. elections to come. Yeah, this I I thought this was a just a terrible decision, um, and I would recommend Justice Ginsburg's dissent to anybody who's really interested in it. Um, but um, I think politically, it's not wishful thinking to believe that um, politically this is going to cause the Republicans some problems. And Eric Cantor, by the way, agrees with this. Uh, because it could lengthen that backlash that I was talking about so that in the midterm elections, 
you have some folks who did not turn out in 2010, did come out in 2012, and come out again in 2014, which uh, in some swing, I don't think it's been enough, I don't think it's going to be enough to uh, change give, the change the house, because, um, see, what happened was, my, my book starts uh, with the uh, election night 2010, the Democrats had what the president called a shellacking, and they had the double misfortune that it was in a census year. So all of the they, they took so many state legislatures, the Republicans did, that they redrew these lines to lock in control of the House until 2020. So even though Obama, even though Democrats got more than a million more votes than Republicans for the House, Republicans have 55 percent of the seats. And that won't change. But in some marginal Senate races and some marginal House races, the fact that uh, people feel that the Republicans are still coming after them on their most precious right, the right to vote, uh, I think will mobilize, have a mobilizing effect. And I also think it's possible that enough people like Eric Cantor recognize this, that there actually might be some new legislation, uh, which is entirely permissible under this court decision. As recently as 2006, a lot of Republicans voted to renew the Voting Rights Act. So, you know, some of them get this. Uh, and even though right now everybody's saying, oh, there won't be any legislation, it'll never happen, I'm not so sure. I think especially if in 2014, if this backlash continues, then in 2015 you could see renewal of the Voting Rights Act that does not single out the South the way the 1965 Voting Rights Act did, um, but has some provisions to protect voting. Um, so you spoke about Romney's confidence and Paul's confidence. Um, I was just curious about Barack's confidence during the campaign because at times it wasn't so clear that he was going to win and he yeah. knew that his legacy was on the line. And I'm just he was, he was uh, quite confident um, but also very determined and uh, you know, determined to do what it took. Uh, so after the first debate, to which I devote a chapter and everything that went wrong, with, and he was 0 for 6 against uh, John Kerry playing Mitt Romney in, in the mock debates, you know, after that point, he, he said to his people, look, I lost that debate. He said to his friend Patrick Gaspar, uh, he said, you know that viral video of Samuel L. Jackson going into the Democratic home and saying, wake the fuck up. Obama says, I didn't realize he was talking to me. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, so, but he said to his people, look, I lost that first debate. I'm going to win the second and third debates and I'm going to win this election. Bet on it. You know, he was very, very confident all fall. And even in, you know, with his close friends, he wasn't betraying a lack of confidence. However, there was also a period which I call Obama's low point, he called his low point, in August of 2011, when he turned 50, interestingly, right around the time of his 50th birthday. Uh, and um, it was right after the debt ceiling fiasco. And um, uh, a year or so later, he and his aides were sitting around talking about, what was our lowest moment? What was the worst, you know, in all of our years? So somebody said, well, it was when we lost New Hampshire to Hillary. Somebody else says, no, it was uh, uh, the Reverend Wright business. And uh, the president says uh, quietly, no, the debt ceiling. And that's when he really felt, you know, Democrats were very angry at him. They thought he was going to give away too much uh, on entitlement reform. The Republicans were triumphant that they had blocked him. Uh, his poll numbers were bad. Um, the economy didn't seem to be doing very well. And it was at that point that he said, look, I'm just going to run the, I might lose, but I'm going to run the campaign I want to run. And that's when he, he actually did move, move to the left. I mean, I don't think of it as the left. I think of it as the center, which is why I call the book The Center Holds. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think one political party went way out right of center, Another party, the other party, the Democrats, are a little left of center, but basically he was defending the center. Um, and so in the fall of 2011, he said, all right, you know, I'm not going to mess with these guys anymore. Everything I'm for, they're against. And he went into 
full campaign mode. And I think it wasn't until um, his message started clicking. Actually, the message, this is a make or break moment for the middle class, that came from a woman in a focus group in Ohio. And you know the campaign picked up on it. And once he started to find his groove with that and the speech he made in Kansas where he echoed Theodore Roosevelt, then I think once he was on message, I think he had his full confidence by the turn of the year, by the beginning of 2012. But 2011 was a very bad year for him. And I think even he was frustrated and worried that he might not get reelected. What's your prognosis on the president changing his personal style, particularly towards the Republicans? In that same debate prep chapter, you talk about how he moves on to the next thing. So the election is not a fluke, but it's going to reinforce his lack of connection with the personal element of his job. Well, I, you know, I have a chapter called Missing the Schmooze Gene, uh, which I think is, is a problem for him because when he gets in trouble, he doesn't have these personal relationships to fall back on. Now, it's hard to show that that actually hurt him on any particular piece of legislation, but it can't help to leave a tool in the toolbox um, that every president, going back to George Washington, has used. And, but he, um, uh, you know, he hasn't given up on the Republicans, uh, and I think he, he worked closely with the Gang of Eight, which had four Republicans. And he was, I actually just heard from somebody in the White House today that he was in very, excuse me, very fre frequent contact with uh, Lindsey Graham and John McCain and, and um, the two other Republicans, uh, well, less so the two other Republicans, I guess, who were in the Gang of Eight, but uh, particularly McCain and Graham, who, you know, were brutal toward him on Benghazi, but he wasn't going to let that keep him from talking to them a lot about immigration. So, you know, he knows that that, that his legacy uh, it, it will partly be made up of whether he gets that bill through, and I think he will do whatever it, whatever it takes. Um, you know, he said to people that he'd, you know, literally, it's, it, um, I'm saying this for the first time, so if somebody wants to tweet it, give me credit, because I'm telling you first, but I heard that he actually said that I'll go over and wash their car if that's what it takes. <laughs> uh, so he's, you know, he is determined to try to do more and he is a self-aware guy. I think he realizes that he didn't do what he needed to do in his first term in terms of uh, reaching out. And I, uh, I chart that in in some detail because I do think it's one of the big shortcomings of his of his first term that uh, he uh, he get, just got too insular and didn't. Uh, it partly because he doesn't get what do they need the third picture of me to hang in their bathroom you know <laughs> and the answer to that is yes and that you know he doesn't really get the neediness of politicians it's it's a little bit of an abstraction it's a little bit of an abstraction to him but you know he does say his favorite movie is the godfather and there's that line in the godfather from hyman roth this is the business we have chosen you know he's chosen to be in this business where he has to stroke them and you know throw on the extra praise and tell them how great they are. And this is just part of the job description, and he hasn't been doing that all that much, which I think make the fact that he's not just another politician makes him quite popular outside of Washington and maybe with you guys. But, you know, inside of official Washington, it's it's been a problem for him, um, which I explore. And it also hurt his relations with the business community that he didn't kiss their asses enough. Yes. So um, starting with Mark Hanna and then the Pendleton Act um, and moving through Buckley. Pendleton Act. This and, guy knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. And, and moving through Buckley and then, I mean, I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff, and then through, uh, and then to Bikra with McCain and Feingold and uh -huh. Massachusetts Right to Life. Um, and now we're at Citizens United. Um, we found that campaign finance changes a lot. And it, um, we go to some systems, then we revert back to others. Right. And do you see... Um, the super PAC era to stay for a while, and um, and if so, do you think it's the right campaign finance to have for our system? No, no. I mean, I'm I'm a huge supporter of campaign finance reform, uh, and actually, uh, you know, covered it for Newsweek and um, spent a lot of time with John McCain in 2002 when they were working on that in Feingold. Um, no, I think it's a terrible system, um, but 
money in politics is like water running downhill. It finds its way. So the real issue, um, uh, in, in, I think it's going to be hard to get the court to revisit Citizens United until there's a change, unless or until there's a change on the court. Um, but in the meantime, there are a number of local models uh, of campaign finance systems that work much better um, with, with matching, matching funds. And so at the local and state level, there are things that can be done um, that are very promising. And even, even in some Republican areas like Arizona, they now have so campaign I, th finance I thought reform. they found that wasn't too effective because there are flaws with that system. There are flaws with all the systems. Well, As I right. said, the, the water, it's like water, it's always going to find its way into the system. So the real question to think of is big money or small money? And this is, to me, one of the things that was so important about this Obama 2012 campaign. I actually don't have a big problem with small money in politics. Because, you know, if you, if with $66, what kind of influence are you really buying, you know? And um, as long as it's, it, but w the thing that's bugging me right now the most is that Mitch McConnell, he just got completely nailed on this the other day at AEI by Norman Ornstein. Uh, you know, he's now against disclosure. And Ornstein confronted him with how, I remember during the McCain-Feingold debates, going to a briefing that uh, McConnell gave in the Senate press gallery where he said, I'm for, I'm for some change, I'm for disclosure. He said that over and over and over again until the Democrats and Obama proposed it. And now not only is he against disclosure, he is saying he was never for disclosure, was, which is what you call a big fat one. And when, <laughs> and when Norm Ornstein confronted him on this, he went kind of nuts, you know, and started insulting Norm. You know, so, I mean, the first thing you have to deal with is, is you know, even if people are philosoph people can have philosophical uh, principled objections, and, and many conservatives do, and when they're consistent with their, their ideology, it's fine. What makes me crazy is when people don't tell the truth about what their positions were in the past. Uh, and so I want the Republican Party to be held to account for the fact that in the past they have been for at least disclosure. And that disclosure can be helpful. That sunshine can be helpful with, with, with the internet. You know, it can bring, bring public pressure to bear so everybody knows who Sheldon Adelson is, you know, and what he wanted to buy. And I don't think he ended up helping uh, Romney very much. Um, because, you know, the, there's, the other thing is that the super PAC money, and I do think it's going to continue, but another really heartening thing that came out of this election is that Super PACs are really only good in the air, not on the ground. So they can't buy you a ground game. Because if so, just contrast some of the Obama volunteers that we heard from a minute ago. They go in there, they're really for the president, they're volunteers, they know they're, they're on a neighborhood team, maybe they're a neighborhood team leader, they know their neighbors. Contrast that to what the Koch brothers tried to buy in this election. And they did, you know, they had some success uh, at the state and local level with this. But a, you're paying a, a ground worker. He goes in there. He's reading a script. I'm here from Restore Our Future. We believe that to restore our future, you should contribute to the Republican Party and support the Repu Republican Party. The person at the door knows that this person's being paid. They've never heard of Restore Our Future. Uh, you know, super PACs can't be explicitly on behalf of the candidate, they have to represent these, you know, idiotic sounding organizations like Col Stephen Colbert, my wife works for, his was called, for a better tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, by the way, I have to, I'm sorry, this is really off the point of your question, but um, I think we have time. I can, should I tell you the Stephen Colbert, Obama? Yes. Uh, this, there's a picture in the book of Obama laughing so hard as he's leaning up against Colbert. Um, and this was, uh, uh, do you remember Donald Trump's offer to the president? He said, I will give three million, this is in October of last year, I will give three million dollars to charity of his choice if he releases his birth certificate, which he'd already done a year earlier, long and short form, 
his college transcripts, which was just a racist way of saying he's stupid and wasn't smart enough to get into college, even though he was the editor of the Harvard Law, Law Review, and other things that Trump wanted. Um, so the next night, Stephen Colbert goes on the air and he says, I have an offer for Donald Trump. I will give $1 million to the charity of Donald Trump's choice if he lets me dip my balls into his mouth because that's the only way to make sure nothing comes out of it. <laughs> Said this on television, right? So fast forward to, fast forward to after the election and it's the Kennedy Center honors and Stephen Colbert has been asked to introduce David Letterman at the Kennedy Center honors and he's going through the receiving line and he sees the uh, first, the president, the first lady, and he says, congratulations, Mr. President, on your victory. And he says, well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, you know, your Colbert Super PAC helped. And Colbert says, well, we can't talk about that. That would be coordinating, right? <laughs> and the president says, but we can talk about your offer to Donald Trump. <laughs> and, uh, and at that point, Evie Colbert, um, Stephen's wife, is sort of turning red because this offer had she's got some young children and they had heard about it at school and, <laughs> and and Michelle Obama bounds over and she says we watched that video over and over and over again <laughs> uh, so you know he can't go public against his enemies but he does try to uh, cheer on those those who are um, I think he is in answer to your question he is very worried about uh, super PACs very worried about a, a great advantage that uh, you know Republicans tend to have in this area um, but uh, there was a little bit of a David and Goliath thing going on because uh, you know Obama I think he dealt a serious blow to campaign finance reform in both 2008 and 2012 by rejecting public financing which we'd had in this country ever since Watergate and he doesn't take an, the blame that he deserves for his role in doing that um, but uh, when he decided that he was going to finally very late in the game when it looked like they were going to get outspent embrace super PACs his super PAC run by Bill Burton his former aide spent much much less money than the Romney the pro Romney super PACs but their ads were a lot better, and they cut through better. So sometimes creativity can compensate f uh, for a, a financial advantage. I think most of us who were uh, given uh, the Obama campaign money we didn't have were not aware of the tech machine, but we were watching uh, uh, Nate Silver. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that is what kept... I yeah, he was a security blanket yeah, for Democrats. Yeah. So do you have anything to yeah. say about what he was doing and so what the Obama campaign? One campaign. of the things that interested me about Nate Silver is that a year before the election, he did a cover story in the New York Times Magazine. The headline was, Is Obama Toast? And it said that if the economy didn't get better, he had a 17% chance of being reelected. So a lot of people think, oh, this was always in the bag. You know, it's always going to... No, the, Nate Silver thought it was... Very iffy, a year out. So, um, but he was using a lot of the same um, uh, techniques uh, that were being used uh, inside the cave and and by um, Obama's pollster Joel Benenson, a very good pollster. And so they just had, you know, it, their numbers were quite similar uh, to Nate Silver's. Um, but you know, the trashing of Nate Silver before the election. <laughs> Well, it was just, it was fascinating to watch. And, and I got into, um, you know, why they were deluded that way is, a, is an important part of the story that I try to tell. So, For practical purposes, uh, Bobby Jindal said it very, very properly, and it goes for both parties. Let's not be the party of stupid. Uh, Mitt Romney lost yeah. very specifically because he couldn't be specific about how to deliver jobs. Uh, he also couldn't be specific about how to make health care better. And then he was stuck with the far right. But for practical purposes, how would you make things better? 
and not, <laughs> not tap into people's that, pockets. That's a really uh, okay. So I'm going to answer this very, very briefly. Um, I think in, at the meta level, because I think these campaigns are run both at the level of message and candidate, what the candidates are saying and the issues, and also at the mechanics level. So I agree with you that uh, Romney offered nothing except tax cuts as a way to create jobs, and the American public no longer believed that that was the way jobs were created. They, they had, they had a, enough of a memory, they were mature enough to know that that hadn't worked in the past and wasn't likely to work in the future. So what would I recommend? I would recommend, for starters, what is called the American Jobs Act, which was introduced in September of 2011 and included a lot of infrastructure spending and other job creation proposals that would have yielded, at a minimum, a million new jobs. And these were provisions that had bipartisan support in the past and were only rejected because Barack Obama embraced them, which is a sign of the dysfunction of our politics that common sense solutions to job creation, it's not a magic wand, it doesn't restore us to the status quo ante, but it would have created a significant number of jobs that these were rejected for no other reason than that Obama was for them. Um, so I, I would start there and then I also would think much more creatively than the Obama White House is right now about other job creation ideas that in some cases could relate to the tax code. Uh, and I think that they have both in late 2010 and, uh, and uh, in 2011, and, and again, arguably now, they've taken their eye off of jobs more than they should, and they need to, to refocus. It's not that they don't spend any time thinking about it, because they, as I think Patrick would confirm, they, they do spend a fair amount of time thinking about it, but they, they do not have it front and center on the American agenda, uh, the way they they probably uh, they probably should. Um, but I think rebuild America is the two word answer to your question. Yeah, thanks.